those of you who are not uh, from North Dakota, welcome to the Badlands of North Dakota. What a perfect autumn day we're going to have here. Uh, this is the kind of weather we really most love in North Dakota, so we're so thrilled that we're going to get to show you uh, Roosevelt's uh, Little Missouri River Valley on an absolutely quintessential North Dakota fall day. So, the, What we did last year at this time was have a, a kind of a roundtable discussion featuring all the scholars who were still around and people could ask questions and it's more informal as you see. The, the, one of the things we don't particularly like about May Hall, Stickney Auditorium, is that it has that proscenium feel and the audience is so much removed from uh, the presenters. That's not a good way, I think, to present uh, symposia. So in the long run, we'll have better facilities, but uh, this is really fun. And last year, we just had a great time. But we're going to begin with Dr. James Martin. And this, this is something that I'm really, really excited about because, you know, Stacy Cordery is a Roosevelt Scholar and, and Betty Boyd Caroli is a Roosevelt Scholar and so on. The Roosevelt Scholars, and, and that's what they do, and that's why we brought them. But we wanted to have a historian who's interested in family and in children, but who is not particularly a Roosevelt expert, um, think, come to the symposium and listen and read some books about this and read letters and sort of just absorb what has been going on here. And then to provide a perspective about the Roosevelt family dynamics, but not as somebody who's so far into it that it's impossible to see it fresh. And so that's your role, and we're really excited about that. You've probably had a chance to read a little bit about Dr. Martin. He's a South Dakotan. Um, he is a professor and chair of history at Marquette University. More intriguing to me, he's the founding secretary treasurer of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, um, and the current president of the Society of Civil War Historians. He's written uh, or edited more than a dozen books. You've seen at least one of them here. The Children's Civil War, which won the Alpha Sigma Nu Jesuit National Book Award for History in 1999 and was named uh, Outstanding Academic Book by Choice Magazine. So if you would just take some time, uh, Dr. Martin, and step back and sort of tell us what you've heard and tell us what you see and tell us how the Roosevelt's fit um, in the world of family and, and childhood at the beginning of the 20th century. Dr. James Martin. Well, I'm glad you made my apologies for me, because I know nothing about the Roosevelt's. I'm glad I got the right Roosevelt, at least, to talk about. I got that much straight. I also missed the memo at the casual Saturday. I'm a little overdressed, so I, I'm not quite what you had in mind, I don't think. Anyway, one of the things about coming last in the program is that all the good lines have been taken. Um, you're going to hear some things that you've heard already. Uh, in fact, one of my favorite quotes that I found like my research um, is on the brochure. Uh, but anyway, I'll just say that anyway, so bear with me uh, as you hear a few things that um, um, you might have heard before. And I think um, earlier speakers talked a lot about um, uh, Theodore's children's response to him. Uh, some of the bitterness that, um, some of the bitter comments Ted made to Dick, Reese, and others, uh, Edith's, you know, uh, ambivalence about certain things. Uh, uh, and, and, and so some of what I'm saying uh, fits into that very nicely. Uh, and, and, and I'll, uh, also this is a very formal talk. I don't know anything about it, so I gotta write it out. Uh, so what, what, I've, what I've written about is kind of Roosevelt's notion of himself as a father and how he sort of applied that uh, to policy issues and so forth. And so the way that I'm get going at this is uh, as a children's historian, uh, looking at some of the, there's sort of a, an ethos going on in America in the late 1890s and early 20th century. Uh, and I think Roosevelt fit in this very nice, in a lot of ways, he's a, he's a, a the progressive, well, one of two progressive presidents. Uh, the progressive era also the time when there's a great deal of child welfare reform going on. Uh, and that's the context that I'm, I'm gonna try to place this uh, for you. So while I'll tell a few Roosevelt stories, my job is really to provide a larger context uh, than that. Uh, and uh, I, I, I appreciate the invitation. It's, it is great to be. I've never actually been in North Dakota. <laughs> I grew up in southeastern South Dakota. We drove through twice when I was a kid, uh, the far eastern, on the way to Canada a couple times. Um, and so I'm looking uh, forward to seeing your badlands, uh, which I think are kind of more like naughty lands compared to our badlands. But uh, I don't know. Jury's out on that, so uh, I can be convinced. <laughs> 
uh, something different. Uh, but it's great to be here on this. This is my fair weather, too. It's great to be here on that kind of a day, uh, which we, uh, not in my part of South Dakota, but in the, the cool part of South Dakota uh, is also uh, uh, fun. What we have a right to expect, the American boy, wrote Theodore Roosevelt in the May 19th issue of St. Nicholas Magazine. This is a juvenile magazine. He said, he shall turn out to be a good American man. And the chances are strong that he won't be much of a man unless he is a good deal of a boy. He must not be a coward or a weakling, a bully, a shirk, or a prig. He must work hard and play hard. He must be clean-minded and clean-lived and able to hold his own under all circumstances and against all comers. It is only on these conditions that he will grow into the kind of American man of whom America can be really proud. Reading that article published uh, a couple of months before Roosevelt would be nominated for vice president, about 15 months before he became president, it's uh, hard not to picture Roosevelt just checking off a list of boyish and manly qualities that he most admired in himself. But it's also pretty clear that he's sincere. This little four or five page article that he wrote establishes several expectations for American boys. To a certain extent, he's putting the burden on becoming the kind of man whom America can be proud of squarely on the shoulders of the boy subscribers to the magazine. But their parents and teachers and other adults also had a burden to create the kind of world in which those qualities could be nurtured. When we ask what kind of burden children and family were to a man like Roosevelt, I think it's important to look at two complementary impulses. First, he believed he needed to protect his children while at the same time expose them to everything life had to offer. He based his conception of what their lives should be like on his own childhood, which he remembered had been almost deliriously happy. I never read more happy versions of a childhood uh, than he writes in his autobiography. That commitment to raising his daughters and sons to fruitful adulthood was more a happy responsibility than a burden, I suppose. But he also clearly accepted the responsibility by for extending that possibility to children and families less fortunate than his own. Roosevelt's second impulse, then, was to join the Virgin Child Welfare Movement in the late 19th century. As I keep saying, I'm no Roosevelt scholar, but his sympathy for the goals of the movement seems to have been a natural inclination that transcended political calculation. Roosevelt was certainly not famous as a child reformer. Other perhaps bigger ideas crowded his agenda of foreign policy, economic opportunity, conservation. But he was famous as a father, perhaps more so than any previous uh, uh, president. I should be known if anyone else here. <laughs> there we go. It's worth noting that this was an era in which Americans uh, were accustomed to seeing young children in the White House. Unlike presidents uh, for most of the 20th century, whose children were mostly grown up before their fathers became president, most of Roosevelt's immediate predecessors, who went back to Abraham Lincoln, had been fathers of minor children while serving as chief executive. I think we have um, the Lincolns, the Garfield, the Clevelands, um, oh, the Grants, going uh, counterclockwise. The nation mourned the death while Lincoln was in the White House of his son Willie during the Civil War. U.S. Grant had four children between the ages of 10 and 18 when he assumed the presidency. It in his wife's writings and his children's memoir as a kid, he was a very warm father. Woodford V. Hayes had several sons and one daughter, who was only 10 when her father took office. All of James Garfield's five surviving children were under the age of 20 during his brief presidency. While Chester Arthur's two young children, whose mother died just before he took office, were often featured at White House social events. Grover Cleveland was father to one famous child, an illegitimate uh, son took responsibility for as a bachelor when he was before he was president, and five children uh, by his young wife. The first two were watched closely by the press. Uh, according to an urban legend, that's apparently untrue. His daughter Ruth was the inspiration for Baby Ruth candy bars. Well, Esther was the only presidential child actually born in the White House. But Roosevelt was perhaps the most famous White House father. That is, until the current first dad moved his family from Hyde Park to Pennsylvania Avenue. The first family moved into uh, the old house in 1901, apparently brought with them an unprecedented energy. One longtime staffer once referred to the surplus of self-expression and personality. That's a very kind way of putting what he, what he talked about. I think. That the Roosevelt brought to the mansion. While another said a nervous person had no business around the White House in those days. <laughs> this is really my first foray into Roosevelt's Vienna, although TR made a couple of brief appearances in my book on children during the Civil War. 
His recollections of being aware of the war as a very young boy, uh, having a little army uniform that he wore, uh, playing, running the blockade, as though he was one of his mother's Confederate brothers, his viewing the procession of Lincoln's body when it passed through New York on its way to Springfield. Um, I don't know if he was talking, this is a, a, an upper right hand corner, it's a game that you could buy for kids. It's, it's, it's just a uh, uh, maze game. You try to find your way to run the blockade. I think he was actually talking about a made up game that he did. But that, 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 and this is a famous picture. Isn't it supposed that he's in one of the windows up here watching Lincoln procession? Uh, and the jury's out on that, but not mistaken. But, uh, Oh, that's his uh, the grandfather's house, I guess. And this is a, a kind of a famous painting from just after the war, uh, celebrating victory at Gettysburg. You see little kids playing at Army and so forth. Uh, and uh, I kind of imagine that being sort of the class and the, uh, and the spirit of the Roosevelt household during the war. His war time childhood fit nicely into some of the arguments I made in that book, the somewhat detached experiences of the northern middle class children during the war the politicalization of even very young children and the commercialization of the war experience for the youngsters. But it also fits into the idyllic childhood that he describes in his memoirs. As you've already heard, Roosevelt was famously devoted to his own father, and he seemed to want to replicate his romanticized relationship with Peter Roosevelt Sr. as he grew into his role as father to his own children. In many ways, he was a model of a modern middle-class father took an interest in intellectual and physical development of his children or reliant on their mother and servants to manage the household in many of the particulars of the children's lives. He was especially representative, it seems to me, uh, in what one historian calls the newly important role for uh, 19th century fathers and their children's playmates. It's because the thing that he didn't make this up, other men, men were doing this as well. Although Roosevelt might have been, as the same historian writes, the progressive era's paragon of virility and upright manhood, that same commitment to action and the strenuous life fit perfectly into his enthusiastic play with his children indoors and especially outdoors. As he said, children are better than books, and his memoirs suggest that he put their interests first whenever possible, emphasized whenever possible, uh, based on what you've been hearing the last day or two. T.R. Sprinkle references to children throughout his autobiography, his own children, children of friends and relatives, children of impoverished laborers or as beneficiaries of child labor legislation, children suffering from pandemic diseases or victims of war, children enjoying play and books and other pastimes. A search of the Google Books Virgin's autobiography brings up 72 references to children, as well as 17 for child, and this doesn't include the times to refer to children by name or other terms. Of course, many of these references to children appear in size and anecdotes crammed between descriptions of safaris and weighty political issues. Yet he consistently referred to in his autobiography and other sources to the importance to him of his role as a father. Although he would have been disappointed had he lost the election in 1904, he wrote in a book that appears on a brochure for this, uh, uh, it's not my research though, uh, for, the, for the symposium. That no matter how things came out, the really important thing was the lovely life I had with mother and with you children, that compared to this home life, everything else was of very small importance. The origins of this apparently sincere love of being a parent began in his own childhood, which he clearly loved to recall. He described an amusing detail the rather uncomfortable furnishings of his childhood home on East 20th Street, in the strict decorum following the city house. But he absolutely rhapsodized about his family's long summers in the country which offered a round of uninterrupted and enthralling pleasures, as he described them. They included running barefoot, child-sized portions of farm work, a gaggle of pets, and freedom from scratchy upholstery. But one of the delights of the long winter spent cooped up in the city was Christmas, which he called an occasion of literally delirious joy. He loved the presents and the rituals, and as a father, wrote a trying to reproduce them exactly for my own children. He seems to have felt that he had very large shoes to fill when he came to being a father. My father isn't simply was the best man I ever knew. His moving description of Peter Sr.'s quality suggests the kind of man that every boy should aspire to become. The kind of man boy he described in the St. Nicholas article would become. He combined strength and courage and gentleness, tenderness, and great unselfishness. With great love and patience and the most understanding, sympathy, and consideration, he combined insistence on discipline. Yet we children adored him. We used to wait in the library in the evening until we could hear his key rattling the latch of the front hall and then rush out to greet him. And we would troop into his room while he was dressing to stay there as long as we, we were permitted, eagerly examining anything which came out of his pockets. 
Although Bill Brands, uh, who got known in grad school, the same year I did in Wichita, Texas, suggests that Roosevelt may have idealized his father to a nearly unhealthy degree. It also seems to be true that his desire to emulate his father, however impossible to achieve, animated Roosevelt's desire to be the perfect father to his children, and in some ways, to all children. Again, it's difficult not to think that the younger Roosevelt was really describing himself, or an ideal version of himself, when he wrote of his father that, I never knew anyone who got greater joy out of living than did my father, or anyone who more wholeheartedly performed every duty, and no one whom I have ever met approached this combination of enjoyment of life and performance of duty. Teddy was 20 years old when his father died at the age of 46, but he still had been able to observe his father's devotion to, quote, every social reform movement and his involvement in an immense amount of practical, charitable work himself. He was a big, powerful man, but his heart, his son wrote, filled with gentleness for those who needed help or protection. The children sometimes accompanied him to the newsboy's lodging house on Thanksgiving. They would help serve dinner. He was a particular friend and supporter of Charles Lloyd Brace, who you heard yesterday, uh, started the Children's Aid Society, which established various institutions for homeless children and originated the orphan train to the West. Seeking to match this titan of fatherhood was indeed a burden, but a burden that Teddy embraced and apparently relished. Roosevelt had taught a Sunday school class at a local mission, which inspired his son to do the same for several years just before and while he was in college. And it is not a stretch to see the second TR's enthusiasm for social reform as an alderman, police commissioner, governor, and president the desire to match his own assessment of his father's philanthropic interests. This is uh, the, the lead story in St. Nicholas uh, in May 1900 uh, was, was Roosevelt's picture appeared on the frontispiece of that, of that issue. In addition to the mainly descriptive insights into the appropriate childhood that appeared in his memoir, the St. Nicholas article suggested some of what he must have expected from his own children. It also highlighted several common themes for child welfare reformers, although his appro approach seems to be more in the context of old-fashioned virtues. He believed that each generation faced both tendencies for good and for evil, and saw signs in modern life that would help the rising generation make the right choices. He applauded the growing importance of athletics and physical exercise, which have become, which have overcome the effeminacy and luxury of young Americans born to rich parents. He urged boys not to allow the competition to become the most important thing in playing games. Physical exercise in games were intended to create stronger bodies and a sense of rules and fair play. But to follow success, these pastimes could actually inhibit the development of talents and values. Uh, the curious example he gives of this is the British upper classes obsession with plot something, which he kind of for their poor performance in the Boer War going on in South Africa. <laughs> Play should have a constructive effect on all aspects of life. I believe that those boys who take part in rough, hard play outside of school will not find any need for horse play in school. While they study, they should study just as hard as they play football in a match game. Hard, fair play will nurture honesty and modesty, as well as kindness and contempt for cruelty. The boy can best become a good man, he wrote, by being a good boy. Not a goody goody boy, but just a plain good boy. If the rhetoric of fatherhood that Roosevelt frequently employed seems almost impossible, it was. As he heard, he could not always be a perfect father. He was frequently gone and sometimes worried about his absences. When the children were very small, they were frequently with relatives or servants or with their stepmother while she was away from home. Brands remarks at one point that fatherhood was growing on him. I think that's a useful corrective. I mean, the way Roosevelt described himself as though he became a father immediately and was a perfect father all along, and his idealized notion uh, was reality. But that wasn't the case. I think he may have projected his speaking guilt about absences from Alice early on and other children later on. Um, uh, into bond with his brother Elliot, whose addictions and affairs not only threatened to ruin the family name, but also displayed a complete rejection of his parental responsibilities. I think the anger that Roosevelt feels for Elliot has to be wrapped up in how badly he's treating his family during his uh, his, uh, his escapades. So, however sincere Roosevelt was in his statements about his children, they are inevitably idealized versions of, of their lives together. It would be an exaggeration to suggest that Roosevelt had a philosophy of childhood, 
But he certainly had a collection of deeply held beliefs about appropriate ways to raise children, the appropriate ways for children to behave. Simply put, Roosevelt believed that childhood should be fun and purposeful. His life and the lives he tried to create for his children seemed to embody a phrase that child welfare reformers liked to use during this period. First coined by the social worker Florence Kelly on the right, uh, on the slide, it asserted that all children deserve a right to childhood and that the future of the Republic depended on creating a system by which that right could be protected. Well, there's no evidence that uh, he was familiar with the source of Kelly's words, which were published in a very statistic-heavy uh, academic tome. You sort of see the, the phrase up at the top of the, the slide. Roosevelt never sounded more like a child welfare reformer than when he talked about his own childhood, but it, or the ideal childhood that he briefly described in the St. Nicholas article. In fact, Roosevelt, like most progressives, was much more interested in boyhood than girlhood. One of the most pressing social issues in the urban United States in the early 20th century, at least according to reformers, was the boy problem, as they called it. Adolescent and pre-adolescent males who lacked healthy outlets for their energy were without order or guidance in a search for vocations and avocations, and could not and could not participate in older traditions like being an apprentice. Many of the great progressive era reforms for children, playgrounds, expanded opportunities for attending high school, juvenile court systems, and various programs intended to bolster boys' morals. As perhaps the only historian in the room to have co-directed a state version of the play back when I was teaching high school in Iowa a year ago, I can't resist just mention that the whole premise of the con in The Music Man, set in small town Iowa in 1912, was to provide wholesome and distracting entertainment in the form of a brass band for boys who might otherwise turn to playing cool and smoky. It's exactly the sort of thing reformers wanted boys to be doing instead of um, doing anything that rhymes with tea. <laughs> I'd like to contextualize uh, TR's parenting within an ethos that children's historians have been exploring for some time. The spirit of the time, and this time period, in which childhood and children came to be seen differently than they had before. These ideas seem to be reflected in T.R. sense of himself as a father, as well as in his interest as a politician and policymaker. T.R. was not necessarily seen as a leader in child welfare reform, but his personal beliefs and style certainly seem to have reflected the ideas that inspired this movement. Roosevelt Kane became president just a few months before Ellen Key, on the left, a Swedish sociologist and educator, published a book whose wistful thinking nevertheless inspired a generation of reformers and decades later, a generation of historians of childhood. She called her book, The Century of the Child, and it, had, and it was less a reflection of reality than a call to arms of policymakers, teachers, parents, manufacturers, employers, everyone really, to put the interests of the children and the priorities of childhood at the center of family, of community, of government policies. Although T.R. would never have agreed with Key's socialism, her acceptance of free love, her harsh criticism of Christian Christianity, in a larger sense, the present and the sociologist were parts of the same arc and evolution about, of ideas about childhood. He would have approved of her rejection of the idea, quote, that things must remain just as they are, since human nature remains the same. And he might well have admired the philosophy that only by acknowledging the holiness of generation, and by that she meant the coming generation, would society truly advance. I don't think he would have disagreed with her assertion that the future development of human beings could not be left to accident. Civilization, she wrote, should make man conscious of an end and responsible responsibility in all spheres, where the present is acted only by impulse without responsibility. She called this a scientific view of humanity. Late in the book, she criticized society for allowing a generation of young people to have lost their ideals without getting new ones in their place. Such a development impoverishes a civilization, leaving its younger members cynical and empty. But she wrote, and the young generation is inspired with the feeling of having great acts to do, a new century begins. That would be the century of the child that she's writing about. She sounds a lot like him, which is the Nicholas magazine article, which was about the same time. He was more visionary than a fortune teller because, in many ways, the 20th century could be seen as being far more deadly and complicated for children than any century before. Yet her ideas inspired a number of countries to take their responsibilities for children more seriously leading to the startling reforms that have culminated in many European countries and the United States' vast network of policies and programs for children and mothers. In the United States, 
But child welfare reformers have been campaigning against child labor, promoting better health with, uh, among other odd ideas, baby contests. They, they've had contests where you bring your baby in, and the healthiest ones and the prettiest ones will get awards um, at safe fairs and things like this. Organizing groups like the Boys Club and the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, regulating newsboys and milk production, extending the school year and the school day, sending public nurses into poverty stricken neighborhoods, and offering countless other ideas to better the material lives, especially of children. This is all happening in about a 15, 20 year period, the end of the 1890s. Pediatrics have become one of the first recognized specializations in medicine late in the 19th century. Social workers have begun earning professional degrees in the University of Chicago at the turn of the century. And dozens of settlement houses have been established in American cities during the late Gilded Age. But most of these programs and campaigns were put forward by private associations or state or local governments. The federal government would not make a serious effort to address the specific problems and opportunities of childhood until 1909. And what happened because of Theodore Roosevelt? Just as Key's book provides one convenient bookend to the beginning of his administration, so does the 1909 White House Conference in the Care of Dependent Children provide a convenient and meaningful bookend to the end of his administration. The conference was not Roosevelt's idea. Child welfare reformers have regularly held conferences uh, on health and legal issues, playground development, <coughs> nutrition, education. Sylvan House, like Hull House, sponsors workshops for welfare workers and parents alike. Well, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the National Congress of Mothers, advocated for more federal support for children's issues. Well attended child welfare exhibits, uh, where the, the displays of both the problems and solutions to urban problems where the children were mounted in New York City and Chicago in 1911. Hundreds of thousands of people came to the exhibits. The men and women who founded these organizations attended their conferences and wrote for their publications were professional journalists, social workers, and experts in a number of fields related to urban life. Modern American might call them policy wants who have broken free from an amateur, uh, religious-oriented reformism of the 19th century. They were less judgmental than previous generations, more interested in the well-being and in the souls of the people they were trying to help, and dedicated to bringing the resources of local, state, and federal governments, as well as private interests, to bear on social problems. And Roosevelt had a close relationship with a number of them. Among the originators and participants in the Washington Conference were a number of men and women with whom Roosevelt had worked in New York, including social workers, policymakers, and political supporters. They included Charles Warren Grace Jr., son of the founder of the Children's Aid Society. Elmer Ellsworth Brown, Roosevelt's appointee as U.S. Commissioner of Education. Homer Folks, head of the New York State Charities Aid Association, with whom Roosevelt had served in various boards and committees related to mental illness and health issues. Edward T. Devine, editor of the Reform Magazine, Charities in the Commons, and a close political associate, associate in New York. John Joy Edson, who had served on several housing and welfare committees of TR, and on the inauguration committee for the president. William B. Wall, founder of the Henry Street Settlement in New York. And of course, in the middle, um, Jacob Reese, whose reporting and pioneering photography of New York slums that inspired Roosevelt when he was a police commissioner. Others included Owen R. Lovejoy, a uh, descendant of abolitionists, uh, the child labor activists who had worked with Roosevelt to form the Progressive Party in 1912 and Jane Addams, who would second his nomination for president in that same year. In the letter to the president, requesting that he convene the conference, the reformers quoted Roosevelt's message to Congress in 1904, and his protection to Roosevelt's ideas about childhood, I thought, in which he recommended the creation of a juvenile court for the District of Columbia, and said, no Christian and civilized community can afford to show a happy the lucky lack of concern for the youth of today. For if so, the community will have to pay a terrible penalty of financial burden and social degradation in the tomorrow. Again, that sounds very much like Ellen Key, I guess, talking about been thinking about the future with these kids. Meeting in Washington late January 1909, this is kind of an amazing thing. The letter goes out in December, the meeting in January, the report comes out in February. Uh, things don't work that fast in the bureaucracy anymore. <laughs> this is a few weeks for Roosevelt to leave office. These are nearly 200 very serious men and women. Uh, discussed how best to care for the startling number of children and youth living institutions, including 93,000 orphanages and group homes, 50,000 foster homes, perhaps 25,000 in, in juvenile correctional institutions. In his report to Congress a month later, Roosevelt endorsed his recommendations and argued that the interests of the nation are involved in the welfare of this army of children 
no less than in our great material affairs. Roosevelt may not have been the first president to suggest that the well-being of children was a good thing for the nation, but he was the first one to make specific recommendations to Congress to accomplish this. He asked Congress to help the government establish a system of uh, best practices and standards for caring for dependent children that would focus on home for the institutional care. So I think Doug tells nice with Roosevelt's own belief in nurturing value and qualities of home and heart. He also asked them to establish a federal children's bureau whose main priority would be conducting research on these questions relating to childhood. He urged Congress to pass this law that would bring the practices and policies of all the states and territories into line with federal standards. Such legislation was, he wrote, not only important to the welfare of the children immediately concerned, but important as setting an example of a high standard of child protection by the national government. The Children's Bureau, which he's talking about, which he's urging Congress to pass, was finally established by Congress in 1912 as a small agency within the Department of Commerce and Labor. It's been overshadowed by other Roosevelt initiatives. Uh, in fact, it was less an initiative than an idea that he adopted. But it marked the first time that the federal government created a permanent agency devoted to a single class of Americans, at least those not living in reservations or disabled soldiers. Julia C. Lathrop was named his first director, uh, and although she had a tiny budget, only $25,000 in his first year, and a small staff, over well, the next 30 years, the Bureau conducted research on child labor and health issues, published pamphlets on child rearing and nutrition, and sponsored events celebrating infant and children's health. One of the successes was convincing Congress to pass the Shepherd Towner Act in 1921, which appropriated $7 million to establish local departments of maternity and infant hygiene. During its three decades of existence, the Bureau published scores of studies, some hundreds of pages long, on child care, child health, and child labor. Some historians of the Bureau are critical of its focus on a narrowly middle class of the values and assumptions and on its framing of child welfare as a woman's issue as opposed to a family issue. But these approaches, as well as the failure of the federal government to support its programs and adequate resources, hindered the effectiveness of the Bureau and its eventual absorption into a larger agency inevitable. But what I talk stress here is the slight limitations. The Bureau that Roosevelt helped found was an important marker in the development of federal policies on children and overlooked legacy of TR's presidency. And it's a, it's a perfect example of a progressive era of bureaucracy. Statistics, experts, um, rely on research uh, to, to, to figure out what the problems are and figure out ways of, 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 of uh, addressing them. These two bookends to Roosevelt's time in office, the notion of the 20th century as the century of the child, the first federally sanctioned professional conference on issues related to children, established both the philosophical and the scientific linchpins to a new century of thought about American childhood and children. Roosevelt was essentially drawn to the issues. He must have found a huge gap between the kind of childhood he and his children enjoyed and the childhoods endured by millions of other American children difficult to accept. Um, the pictures I'm showing you here are a pretty famous picture by Lewis Hines, who was a photographer a child, uh, anti-child labor organization who traveled around the country. Uh, and you've probably seen like, some of these. Uh, and just sort of, I was picked by how, how much alike this girl working in a mill in South Carolina is dressed like the two little girls uh, in the little pictures. This is uh, one of the, the uh, atrocities of child labor is that there are kids working mines. This is a minor, who's probably about 13, 12, 13 years old um, in West Virginia. I love you guys. <laughs> I don't know what your business is, but it's, they're up to no good, certainly. Uh, <laughs> going on that day. There's actually a whole bunch of pictures of them. They're not straight working, but uh, apparently they're working guys. Uh, they're street guys, uh, wise guys, no doubt. Uh, and also not, uh, they kind of go like that we uh, Americans would be proud of, uh, according to uh, St. Louis Magazine. This is my favorite picture of kids in the city I've ever seen. Uh, they're literally playing in the gutter with a dead horse uh, nearby. I mean, in urban places where it's about 1890s, I think, 1945. Uh, horses still, you can see horses in the background. Um, uh, and they would drop in the harness, and a lot of them fell until some city worker came and got them. Uh, and uh, these kids are kind of not paying much attention to it, or perhaps they're paying lots of attention to it, which even works uh, in some ways. Uh, but this is the sort of scene that uh, Roosevelt doesn't to drive very far from his house in Manhattan to see on the Lower East Side. Is that New York? Yeah, it's in New York. So what exactly was the burden of being Roosevelt? 
as he applied it to the process of growing from child to adult. It seems that his own children took search of the line of St. Nicholas, in which he said that he won't be much of a man unless he is a good deal of a boy. Theodore Jr. was a successful businessman, governor of Puerto Rico and the Philippines, and a highly decorated army officer who died in France after going ashore when the first waves of the I always think of uh, Henry Fonda. Do you think of Henry Fonda from the, from, uh, the Longest Day movie? Uh, he's one of the characters, and, and uh, I always think of him when I think of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, Kermit, despite his sickly childhood, became an avid outdoorsman, accompanying his father to Africa and nation away into the Amazon years later. He also started his own shipping company and served in both world wars. Like his brothers, Archibald served with distinction uh, in uh, both wars. Unlike his brothers, he survived and worked for many years as a Wall Street broker. Quentin followed his brothers in the service during the First World War and was shot down, as you know, and killed a few months before his 21st birthday. The two daughters could not serve their country so uh, formally, although Ethel did work for the Red Cross during the First World War. They seem to have carried the Roosevelt burden by developing strong personalities and unique characters. There were inevitable costs. I sort of gave you a list of the positive parts of the burden. Um, the burden of that being a Roosevelt placed on at least some of his children was particularly in the case of Kermit too much. Alice's relationship with Teddy, as you've heard uh, many times, is famously complicated. Uh, as the oldest and as the one who had been deserted when the grief stricken Roosevelt and West, she probably felt his ambivalence intensity more than other, any, more than the other children. As Bill Brands writes, the guilt that Roosevelt felt for the frequent absence of announced outside responsibilities surfaced the intensity of his rambunctiousness with them in the high, sometimes impossibly high, standards he set for them by both an exhortation and example. This is another quote you've heard before, I believe. It is exceedingly interesting and attractive to be a successful businessman, or a railroad man, or a farmer, or a successful lawyer, or a doctor, for the Roman's autobiography. Or he somewhat slightly continued with the catalog, again, of all the interesting things he had done. A writer, or a president, or a ranch man, or a colonel of fighting. You think it better and better if you go along, I think, in his mind. Or to kill grizzly bears in alliance. However, for unflagging interest and enjoyment, Household and children of things go reasonably well certainly makes all other forms of success and achievement lose their importance by comparison. I actually think he means this. Um, you know, no expert, um, uh, but um, my reading of him and of his actions and the way he, in fact, heard actually uh, this this weekend, just that while there are so many ambivalencies about him and his children and his childhood in general, uh, I don't think he's he's making it up when he says that. I'm not sure I would say he thinks it's better to be a father, but certainly it's equally important to be a father. It has to be all these other things. If father was a burden, Roosevelt wore it lightly and took it seriously and characteristically brought that seriousness to his efforts as a social, uh, efforts of social reform. Now, I think in the context of childhood and child rearing, the burden of being Roosevelt was trying to figure out how to extend at least some of his privileged and joyful childhood to others. The 20th century turned out not to have been the to the child, although, admittedly, childhood in the West, especially, saw improved standards of living and greater expectations of that right to childhood that Florence Kelly had written about. But many of the challenges facing children while Roosevelt was raising his sons and daughters, and while he was developing into a heap of a federal policy on children, remained huge obstacles for many American children. Poverty, access to health care, to good schools, disrupted families. Those conditions were never really a burden that Roosevelt's many generation really had to face. They are certainly the burdens facing most children of any era. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much. A lot of nice perspective. Now we have time for a few questions, then we're going to take a break so you can all use the restrooms and coffee up, and then we'll have. <laughs> Um, uh, roundtable discussions or questions for Dr. Martin. Well, I think the point I'm trying to make is not that Roosevelt really had much of an effect personally on how we think about childhood. He's reflecting a thought about childhood I think that's very important. And that um, uh, he fits into this, this, this growing appreciation of children as a central part of, of society. There's a, a book called Price and Price's Child, which is about, actually about lawsuits uh, with, with wrongful death. An insurance company, kind of this in the 19th and the 20s, in which uh, there's a shift in the 20th century, early 20th century, from people thinking of children as being commodities. Uh, now, I don't mean that necessarily in a completely negative sense, just sort of 
you know, if the child died, what, what that child's work uh, in the custody cases, you know, fathers got physical children, usually in the 19th century, because fathers had the business the children would be coming up in, uh, or at the farm the children were working on. Uh, and that changes because they stopped being able to put a price on the usefulness of the child as, as they became less useful until they were adults. And so you have much bigger awards given by jury because of the emotional loss of the child is an accident. Um, and so that's kind of way a far field here, but Roosevelt is reflecting a set of ideas about children more than creating them like that. Now you kind of talk about games and play and things like this. That's actually, again, part of, I don't think he invented that either. I mean, the playground movement, the, the, all the, 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 this, the rise of high schools and formal activities at high schools going on at the same time, he's writing about these things. So it's really part of the ethos, I think, that, that he reflects on. So, you know, I, I think exaggeration is sort of the side point. Um, the fact that he's saying it, the fact that he believes this is the right way for a childhood to be, is a, is a very important thing. And again, this reflects on yeah. Thank you. Question over here. You know, I'm just wondering if we get caught. Teddy Roosevelt sounds like he was probably a pretty strong Dutch reformer. I have told you everything I know about Roosevelt. No, <laughs> <life now. laughs> so. um, can you talk a little bit about the difference the Children's Bureau and the impact of the legislation between the world and the urban? It seems more focused on urban. It's absolutely focused on urban. Um, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. The question was about the difference between rural and urban efforts at child welfare reform. In some ways, in, in rural areas, you already have some of the extension service. You know, I, I don't know if they help, you know, but further extension help folks out here. But the egg schools uh, set up in the 1850s, 70s, 80s, and after. Um, there's lots of child welfare. I mean, that's what, how they do it, kind of. So 4-H is just like Boy Scouts, only for country kids, you know, in terms of things to do. I can't remember 4-H started. It's a little later than that, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, well, it's not much later, though. When was the 4-H? Before World War One, I think. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I was a top kid. I went one for it for six months. I never have a problem with this one, but, but uh, <laughs> we didn't have paths. How many you for to have a path? Um, but anyway, uh, so there there is a rural counterpart that's going on. But but in the late 1920s, it's absolutely the urban kids, it's the immigrant kids, uh, it's what the slums are developing. Uh, they're still sending kids out west on trains, you know, out of the cities, you know, so that the, the impulse is that city life is bad. This is a re real big generalization, and they didn't even make it this generalized. Uh, country life is good, uh, it's clean work. And this is why child labor legislation doesn't cover farm kids in the city ever. Um, when I was growing up, my classmates were out in the field and track when they were seven years old, uh, and uh, that's silly. <laughs> but, uh, and I was really working stuff that I shouldn't be working out long before I was of age. Uh, it's complicated. But, um, so yeah, there, there are parallel movements, but the, the formal child local reformers were all city people, and they were focusing on... Many came, in fact, Jane Addams from a small town in Southern Illinois. Uh, she kind of applied her small town values and ideas about family and childhood to what she liked perfectly. She kind of tried to recreate that for her kids living in uh, the West Side of Chicago. Here. Yes, last night we heard of uh, TR admonished not to speak disparagingly of the children. <laughs> and we did learn yesterday that she often did, and that she often had the uh, full <coughs> care of the children. Do you think uh, TR and you have a conflict on how to raise their children? I think most fathers and mothers do at one time. <laughs> uh, but again, I, I haven't read those particular documents myself. Let's hold those questions because when the panel's here, I feel certain this week. So, with apologies to Kathleen Dalton, Wikipedia says 1900 is the year for the birth of 4A. So, <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> we'll take it as strictly dirty. Uh, Gary, what do you know of, of Theodore Roosevelt and other children and the general study of children and the history of children? Would you see the popularization of sort of this 
this uh, father playing with his kids in a very, you know, in the media and everything, do you think that's sort of the, the birthplace of the modern uh, quality time concept? Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 what, very early on, I mean, there's a, there's a small um, but growing field in sort of man, the history of men, men's history, and we have women's history. Um, I think it's logical to say, well, men's history is the history all along, haven't it? Uh, but in terms of telling men as men, not as politicians, not as leaders, and so forth. Uh, and, and so I, I think, um, and a part of the women, uh, and uh, as it's in three stocks. You know, one of the things that, that, that when I worked on children in the Civil War, I found that fathers writing home wrote a lot about things they do with their kids. Back home, like changing diapers, like giving them breakfast. You know, I don't think most parents do this, fathers do this every day, you know. But there, it's not this line between mothers and fathers that what the roles are that is completely uncrossable. But as they thought about it, uh, almost every, any book or writing about how people think about being a mother or a father or a child is based on advice books, based on kind of idealized versions, because it's less messy to deal with that. It's the only way we can grips with it, I think. Uh, but certainly this quality time idea is something that, that, uh, that uh, Roosevelt, I think, actually with his children. He wasn't around how many hours out of every week would he have been around his kids, you know? But he was there, well, he was there, you know, with those kids. And that's what we mean by quality time, being present when you're with your kids. Not to be sitting in the chair while watching TV, you know, uh, and, and that certainly is, is what you're talking about. Um, One more. more. It struck me when you were talking about what well, about American boyhood and American childhood that we're in some sort of transitional phase that that period, of, the recognition of Americanness as being embraced as distinctive, but yet at the same time, those of the wealthier classes were taking the grand tour, going to Europe, sending the kids to Germany. But we, in the early 20th century, I know we see a transition to celebrating uniquely American art forms and sports like baseball and jazz and, you know, like the jazz age of F. Scott Fitzgerald in 1922. How do you see, as a historian, have you reflected on this, the idea about this transition to Americanness and where did it come from? I think just, I, I haven't thought about that much, but I, I think it's a, just expansion of the, the growing belief in the 19th century of America being a very unique place. And it's a Republican, you know, in a social sense, uh, in a cultural sense. Um, this is also, as you said, there's some more art, artistic forms that are kind of coming out of, bubbling up out of uh, various places. Um, actually, independent art exhibits uh, in American education become somewhat different. Uh, you have public schools, the private schools, like public schools um, in England, um, and, and so there are many things about I think the independence of, the, of America and the independentness of Americans that translates into how they put children too. I mean, they're trying to. You talk about boys becoming Americans by being hard players, hard workers, uh, independent thought, but still good team players. Uh, that's how long he is talking about you know, when she writes her thing. So that Europeans are much more about um, institutional aid to children when they think about this. Uh, and so I think there's a separation uh, from Europe. That's not a very interesting question, I think. But I, there, there certainly is a part of this desire throughout the 19th century, and the Gilded Age especially as America becomes, you know, the industrial um, country, to separate in other ways, too. You know, and become more independent of European culture. She had a lot of not university and colleges started during this time. Uh, and again, the rise of, of, of like public education uh, becomes a real hallmark of how Americans set themselves in the European. There's nothing like that in Europe at this time, especially high schools. Uh, and by 1923, most Americans go to high school for at least a while. Uh, and that's, you know, if you're out of school at the time, you're both 13 in Europe, most are rich. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's why I got to put it in the Thank you, Jane Park. Perfect.